All financial advice provided on this show is for entertainment and educational purposes only. The financial ideas and strategies discussed are only provided as a starting point for a conversation about money matters. With regard to your particular investments and financial strategies, consult your financial planner, CPA, or investment professional. All your financial decisions are yours and yours alone to make and subsequently are solely your responsibility. The information that is supplied through the context of the radio program and any repurposing of its content by the host or network is a combination and collection of solid financial investment understanding, opinion, and comments. This network, show, and its host are not liable for financial strategies, outcomes that you employ in any manner that result in any kind of loss. Shares of corporate sponsors may be the subject of buy or sell recommendations in Jay Taylor's newsletter in accordance with Jay's objective opinion. Welcome to Turning Hard Times into Good Times with your host, Jay Taylor. This hour will help investors fix issues and achieve personal gain. Now, here's your host, Jay Taylor. Welcome to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, speaking to you from Keshkais, Portugal this week. It is the 6th day of September, 2022. Before I talk more about today's show, let me remind you that I do publish a newsletter called Jay Taylor's Gold Energy and Tech Stocks and that you can subscribe to my letter by going to miningstocks.com. I want to thank each of you for listening to this show and encourage you to send along whatever comments you might have about the show. Send them to questionsfortaylor at gmail.com. also want to thank our sponsors for making this show economically viable. Today's sponsors, Irving Resources, Novo Resources, El Oro Resources, uh, Timberline Resources, Lion One Metals, and Rena Gold Corp. I've titled this week's show, The Money Revelation, How Hyperinflation Takes Root. Bob Moriarty and Quentin Henning return as this week's guests. Many things would be better in the world if all educated people knew what money is. For not only economic disturbances such as, such as credit crises and inflation, but also social evils like class antagonisms and mass impoverishments, have the roots in an ignorance about what money is. Even political catastrophes like wars and revolutions are really related to a misunderstanding of what money really is. Robert Moriarty and Make Enders teamed up to translate a book from German to English titled The Money Revelation. The book, which was written by Alfred Landsberg, a banker, economist, and author, and publicist, who passed away in 1937, it details how the ignorance of well-educated Germans enabled the German hyperinflation to take hold, and of course that led to the rise of Adolf Hitler and ultimately uh, World War II. Unfortunately, Americans and Europeans appear now to be almost as ignorant about money as the Germans were in the 1920s and 1930s. That leaves the West very vulnerable to similar economic and political strife as we experienced, uh, as was experienced in Germany in the 1930s and the 1940s. And as inflation is now starting to rear its ugly head here in the West, this book may be one of the most important books available at this time because it lays out the monetary mistakes that led to hyperinflation. Just as in 1920 Germany, current policymakers erroneously think they know how to control rising prices, and the mainstream media continue to suggest the Fed is very much in control. But it is very doubtful that they are, because it's clear after reading this book that Chairman Powell and a thousand PhD economists at the Fed are relatively clueless, even they are clueless about what money really is. Bob Moriarty will walk us through the steps that led to this awful chapter in human history in the hopes of helping listeners be prepared in, as best they can be in the event the same thing happens here. Also, help us understand and keep an eye on what's going on as, uh, as policies are being made by the Fed and by our government. Well, we do have to go to a commercial break now, but don't go away because Quentin Henning will be with me right after the break to give us an update on Lion One's emerging world-class, high-grade Fiji gold deposit, that is the Tuvatu project in Fiji. Don't go away, because I'll be right back with Dr. Quentin Henning.
Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. Lion Wine Metals is focused on high-grade gold in Fiji, led by legendary Canadian financier Walter Barakoff. Lion One is permitted for production and drilling for discoveries in one of the most exciting high-grade gold projects in the prolific South Pacific Ring of Fire. Lion One trades on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol LIO and on the OTCQX under the symbol LOMLF. Go to our website at liononemetals.com for more information about Lion One Metals and high-grade gold in Fiji. You're listening to Turning Hard Times into Good Times with your host, Jay Taylor. If you have a question or comment about today's show, Jay would love to hear from you at 1-866-472-5790. That's 1-866-472-5790. You can also send an email to questionsfortaylor at gmail.com. That's questions, the number four, taylor at gmail.com. Now, back to our program. Welcome back to Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor. I'm really pleased to have Dr. Quentin Henning with me once again. Today he's with me to talk about Lion One, and that company's evolving world-class high-grade alkaline gold deposit in uh, Fiji, known as the Tuvatu Gold Project, and uh, Quentin is a technical advisor to Lion One Metals, um, which is a sponsor to this show. Lion One trades in Canada, LIO. You can buy it down in the States, as I have, under the symbol L-O-M-L-F. 156.4 156.4 million shares trading recently at 85 cents in U.S. money, giving it a market cap of around U.S. $133 million. Welcome, Quentin, and thanks for joining me again. Thank you, Jay. Pleasure to be here. Really good to have you with me. You know, some very exciting developments going on. Um, just for people that might not be familiar with an alkaline deposit, can you talk about them just briefly? Tell us why it should be something that investors pay attention to and why it's potentially very exciting. Yeah, look, these these deposits are some of the choicest gold deposits uh, in the mining industry. You know, if you look at history, some of the most profitable and biggest gold deposits are alkaline gold systems. Uh, examples would be Cripple Creek, which is here in Colorado, uh, the Porgera Mine, which is in New Guinea, uh, Lahir, which is also part of New Guinea. It's a small island off the coast of New Guinea. Uh, and Vaticola, which is a, a mine not too far from Tuvatu, which has produced uh, many millions of ounces of gold over its lifetime. These are tend to be high-grade. Uh, they can be very uh, prolific in terms of the uh, the ounces that they, they generate. Uh, examples, Cripple Creek's probably at 29 million ounces uh, mine plus reserves, and uh, Porgera is probably even more. That I would say uh, probably 30 plus million ounces mined in reserves at this point. Uh, Lahir is probably 45 million ounces mined in reserve. Uh, and then, you know, Vaticola, their nearest neighbor there at Tuvatu, is uh, about 11 million ounces mined, reserved, and resources. So, you know, these, these are big systems uh, and they tend to make a lot of money. So, the, the major miners covet them. Uh, they're, they're funny deposits uh, in the way. That they form, they form from these melts, these magmas that come up that are, have a lot of alkaline metals in them, and you know, as they crystallize and, and so forth in the crust, the fluids that come off those melts kind of concentrate in in the residual material, and just at the last moment, you know, like at the very very last stage of this whole process of magmatism, these things just literally just burp out uh, very high grade gold into all the cracks and fissures and whatnot in the rock above them. So, you know, we can end up with extremely high grades. This is a classic example of of one of these systems. Uh, I've used the analogy several times that these are like trees from the, the, you know, the top down, you you know, basically are dealing with near surface at the smaller branches and and these coalesce into bigger and bigger branches as you go down, you know, and ultimately you find the trunk or the, you know, the big branches and the trunk at depth. And, you know, you can be into some absolutely killer uh, grades, widths, and so forth. That's what we're starting to see at Tuvati. Well, I would think so. On August 15th, there was a press release that put out 75.9 meters grading 20.86 grams per ton. Uh, I think that was from the deeper section, some 500 plus meters down, if I'm, if I'm right. 
about that, that, and that would seem to be that tree trunk that you're talking about, potentially starting to hit into that tree trunk. I think it's it's one of the bigger branches. I don't think you know necessarily we're right in the the trunk yet, but it's one of the bigger branches, and uh-huh. it appears to be the one that fed most of the UR and UR you know URW loads and stuff that sit at surface right above. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of loads that comprise an existing resource, and those are the ones that kind of coalesce to form this bigger branch. And you know it's just a delight to to find the darn thing after you know. Poking at this thing, you know, many, many holes over the past, what, 15, 20 years it's been drilled. And then to find the the feeder structure is, you know. <laughs> really exciting. <laughs> yeah, very. Um, well, you suggested in the past there could be more than one of these deposits. I think probably part of the same system over a seven-kilometer strike length uh, based on surface geology uh, that's been carried out so far. And on August 29th, um, there was an announcement the company put out that approximately two kilometers to the northeast of this initial discovery of what, you know, the main uh, deposit that the company's been expanding and drilling on now, they found a channel sample graded 13.27 grams over four meters. Uh, that was its surface, and another one meter within that larger section uh, graded 36 uh, grams per ton or over an ounce per ton. And then there's another one that graded 17, almost 18 grams per ton over almost a meter. Might yeah. this be, in your view, part of the same system, the same alkaline system? Do we know enough about it yet to know if that's the case? The the mineralization that they found in all respects is identical to the mineralization seen at Tuvati to the southwest. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I will say that it's absolutely part of the same system, uh, but it's... It's its own tree, if you uh-huh. will. It makes uh-huh. sense. Okay, so think of this like, um, l- let me set this the picture a little bit better. Okay, so we have the Nava Lava Caldera, which is basically an extinct volcano. Think of mm-hmm. it that way. Mm-hmm. Right? And it's about seven kilometers across, the big cauldron that the, the whole system formed in. But there's a fault, a big fault that transects the caldera from southwest and northeast. Uh, so it transects about seven kilometers clear across the caldera. Oh. And it actually can, extends all the way up to Vatacola, interestingly. It's the same fault. Oh. <laughs> all right. But uh, in the caldera, um, this this structure, this fault, <clears throat> is where the fluids decided to ascend. Okay, so that magma I talked about earlier, they found places along this fault where there was a lot of, uh, you know, free flow, you know, ability to for fluids to move upwards. And <clears throat> they had effectively formed tree trunks. Think of it that way, like trees and tree trunks uh, along it, okay? And we're finally starting to hone, hone in on the, the um, you know, the other trees that are here. There's one down at uh, Yura Creek and Jamaki in that area, which is to the southwest from Tubati. But this is the first one that we found. Uh, you know, conclusively found like you know, this looks like a Tuvati replicate that's to the northeast, and it's it's exciting because we first saw this area um, in the bleg sampling, the stream sediment sampling, a couple of years ago. Of course, you know, COVID has kind of put a you know a wrench into the works around exploring uh, as aggressively as we had hoped over the past couple of years, but now we're back at it. And the guys decided to push this road up into this area, this Batiri Creek area. Um, uh, and you know, bless their heart, they did because this is exactly where what we needed. We needed to get into the that structural corridor, that northeast structural corridor, to to find these kind of veins. And um, you know, they you're know, right on schedule. They found this vein in four meters of 13 grams. Um, it's a nice fat structure, very much like the big structures at Tuvatu. It um, it has the same mineralogy. If you look at the pictures and so forth, it is just a classic monzonite hosted uh, high grade vein like you see down at uh, at Tuvatu. And it's it, you know structurally, it's got the little fractures and sh- sheeted or shear shear vein and so forth, which is very char- characteristic of all the veins at Tuvatu. It it is in every in respect an extension of the Tuvatu system, but it is sitting over the top of what's probably another tree trunk. So. You know, I, I think this is a big win. Big All right. Win. All right. So there could be more trees in the forest as well. But so let me just ask you, in terms of the current drill program, uh, could you just give a, a real quick review of the current drill program? And then do you think this new discovery will be drilled anytime soon? Because the company certainly seems to have its hands full as it's 
uh, as it's infill drilling in order to get ready for some test production and also continue to explore down that tree trunk. Yeah, so there's there's two styles of drilling going on right now. The company does have six rigs. There's two styles of drilling. There's the infill drilling in, in advance of the planned mine. So they're doing a lot of infill holes drilling in between previously drilled areas. You know, to, to better refine the, the model and be prepared when they go mining. That's occurring mainly at a shallow depth, you know, say from surface down to two or three hundred meters. And then uh, the deeper drilling, which is testing the, the tree trunk part of the system. And, and, you know, that's been ongoing really since 2020 because uh, the first trunk or b- big branch we hit was in late July of that year. And that, that's what convinced everybody, yeah, there's a lot more going on at depth. So there's there's definitely a continued effort to to evaluate that part of the system, very high grade part of the system. Uh, but we would like to get up to Batiri Bench, and I I'm hoping they can do that before the rainy season sets in. Uh, the rainy season usually starts late November, early December, so we should have time here. And uh, we're I'm very hopeful they'll get in there and get a couple of holes uh, up in that part of the world because uh, it would be just as cool as it can be to see all of this hard work the guys have been putting into the surface sampling pay off with uh, you know demonstrable new discovery that that could you know be effectively like I said another tree uh, another entire plume of high grade veins coming up right and for the market to be able to start to see some gigantic high grade deposit obviously you would think would start to get people excited about this story. Uh, just in wrapping up here, Quentin, what um, what should uh, investors be aware of then in terms of share price, potential share price drivers? Would it be any of these great intersects, I suppose, should do it. You know, the markets, uh, as everybody can see, are uh, struggling at, at this time, the gold space especially. It's you know it's disheartening when you put out a news release like we, we had a couple of weeks ago, 55 meters of 12.2 grams. And, you know, but uh, but look, there's going to be more of that. There's going to be plenty more news like that coming. Um, I think we will have uh, a rebound in the gold market, and as soon as that happens, you know, like Lion One, which is advancing this to become a mine and is doing the exploration with great success and delivering news on a routine basis, I think it should be one of the biggest beneficiaries of of the you know re recurring or hopefully re- resumption of the gold market, we'll say. Well, it's going to happen. It's a matter of time, and it's always difficult to know exactly when. But you want to be ready because these things can really take off once the market starts to warm up to this sector. I want to thank you very much, Quentin, for uh, taking the time to be with us again. Um, and uh, we'll look to catch up with you again sometime soon. All right, folks, well, don't go away because coming up next, Bob Moriarty will be with me to discuss a book that laid out the steps that led to the great German hyperinflation that was a major factor leading to the rise of Adolf Hitler in Germany. Might there be some lessons to learn from that past episode? Uh, Might there be some lessons for us in America and for the Western countries around the world in general? Make sure you listen to Bob Moriarty. Be right back after the break. Timberline Resources is a mineral exploration and resource development company focused on gold discovery in the world-class mining jurisdiction of Nevada. The company's flagship Eureka project hosts a significant gold resource and drill-indicated upside potential at nearby higher-grade targets. Timberline Resources trades in Canada under the symbol TBR and on the OTCQB in the U.S. under the symbol TLRS. To learn more about this district-scale asset with exciting discovery potential, please visit www.timberlineresources.co. You're listening to Turning Hard Times into Good Times with your host, Jay Taylor. If you have a question or comment about today's show, Jay would love to hear from you at 1-866-472-5790. That's 1-866-472-5790. You can also send an email to questionsfortaylor at gmail.com. That's questions, the number four, taylor at gmail.com. Now, back to our program. 
Welcome back to Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm pleased to have Bob Moriarty with me once again, this time to talk about a very important book titled The Money Revelation. It uh, was written by a very interesting and talented gentleman named Alfred Landsberg, who was a banker, economist, author, and publicist living in Germany in the early 1900s. Though he was born in London in 1872, Landsberg moved with his parents to Berlin as a child. In 1907, he founded Bank Verlag, publishing house, where he was editor and publisher of Die Bank magazine from 1908 to 1934. He passed away in 1937. The Money Revolution, the Money Revelation is comprised of a series of imaginary letters of Alfred's son, that is to Alfred's son, in an effort to teach him the principles of money and finance. In a backhanded way, in a backhanded compliment, Vladimir Lenin called him quote, the most competent of the bourgeois imbeciles, end of quote, and referred to him frequently in his own writings. Thanks to Make Enders from Germany and Robert Moriarty, who resides in France, both of them, they trans- work together to translate this book from German to English, and so we are now able to learn the insights of Alfred Landsberg, which, though largely, if not totally disregarded by almost every nation now, I believe they are as relevant today as they were a hundred years ago and most certainly provide a map, I, I'm afraid, that suggests the West is currently headed down the road of monetary destruction. The book has three volumes. Uh, the first one has to do with money, and that's the one we're going to focus on mostly today. The second volume has to do with value, and the third uh, volume has to do with monetary emergency. So I'm afraid you know, would probably only get to the a serious discussion of the first one, money, but that's probably the most important discussion in the book because the concept of money is so, well, it's so wrong, what people think of as money, and as we'll discuss with Bob, uh, and I'm so glad, Bob, that you could come on with me to help us understand what money really is and why the misconception of money now is leading us down to the road of destruction. Thanks so much for joining me. Well, it's a real pleasure. Uh, That's something I've been working on for two years, and it's in print now. It's an excellent book. It's in hardback. Uh, It's on Amazon U.S. for $25 and Amazon Canada for $32. Uh, What's interesting to me, well, let's go back into how I got involved in the book. Sure. Uh, uh, I'm going to call him mate because I think that's the correct pronunciation, got in contact with me about two and a half years ago, and he said there is a book that is only in German that is considered the very best book ever written about money, and I want to translate it into English and publish it. And I, I wrote him five or six times, and I kept asking him, how are you getting on with the book? How are you getting on with the book? What are you doing? And he finally came back and said, well, I'm kind of at a, a loss. I need to translate the book into English, and that's beyond my capabilities. Can you do it? And, and I said, well, yeah. And I've got some friends in Germany, and I sent the book to them, and I said, can you translate it? Now, given that a lot of the verbiage in the book revolves around money finance, uh, it it was a little difficult for this woman to translate. And she came back and said, well, look, why don't I run it through a automatic translation program and then you, you just added it from there. So what we thought was going to take six months to a year actually took two days. So I got the book in electronic format. It was mostly formatted. And I went through and changed the archaic language of a hundred years ago sure. to something readers could understand today. So it actually was very easy for me to do that. And then we worked together. I, I sent the book to him. He came up with some edits. He kept, sent the book back to me. And because I formatted half a dozen books of my own, 
uh, quite bluntly, formatting and getting it in print was was a piece of cake. Mm-hmm. Now, here's what's interesting in the, about the book, and I think that you've read enough of this to know. I have never read a book that talked about the function of money, what it's money supposed to do. We talk about what money should be or what money is, but I don't think I've ever seen a discussion of this is how money works. And and it it's brilliant from that point of view. Now you were talking about the first book and, mm-hmm. and I'm not sure that I would call it a book. I, I think the he the way he published it was almost like three pamphlets. Uh-huh. He he published it in his magazine. And when it was assembled as a book, they talked about three books. And it wasn't three books. It was really three subjects. Uh, so people shouldn't be confused. It isn't a big, thick book. Uh, it's a simple book. It describes money. It describes how people work. And they're creating credit because the person who's paying them or is going to pay them uh, owes them an obligation. And likewise, if if you're a pig farmer and you want to to get some rice, uh, how do you exchange the pig for the rice? The mere act of working creates credit. And he takes money to its, its very most basic. Um, it's a, a means of exchange of value, and uh, it's very important that both sides get something out of it. Now, let me let me fast forward. The book was written from late December of 1920 until 1922, and of course, that was the very height of the German uh, hyperinflation. So fast forward to today, uh, we certainly appear to be going into hyperinflation. I've been following the energy market in, in Europe and the cost of energy, coal, natural gas and, and petroleum is up tenfold in the last year. And if that isn't hyperinflation, I don't know what is. Yeah, and everything flows from energy. Everything else, you know, energy. Everything depends on energy. So, uh, well, let's let's start talking about the book. And as as I mentioned, it was it's a series. Uh, you say three pamphlets, essentially three topics. The first one being money. What is money? Uh, and and uh, you know, it was written. It starts out with the first letter to uh, to Alfred's son. It was written on New Year's Eve. These are imaginary letters. It was written on New Year's Eve, 1920. Uh, and what really struck me, Bob, as I read this, was the similarities of culturally to what's going on in the United States now. For example, it talks about two nations. Well, it was a nation divided into two groups of people, the haves and the have-nots. Um, and the attitude of bankers and disregard for the people, the deplorables, if you will, as Hillary Clinton has called many of us, uh, there are two different kinds of people, the good ones and the bad ones, the ones that are irrelevant and the ones that are important. That was something that I got out of the first uh, the first letter to Alfred's son. And uh, it, I just, you know, I guess I, I think that that letter sets the stage for the rest of the first uh, of the first topic uh, on money, because it, it gets to the heart of why is there this division and the role that money plays in creating this division and dividing society. Uh, and so I, I don't know if you have any comments on uh, the first letter and that and that idea. Well, interestingly enough, the third topic, when he talks about the emergency, he goes into that in depth and talks about the destructiveness of inflation, because inflation literally is stealing. Somebody is stealing from the other person. Sometimes it's the person who's the purchaser, and sometimes it's the the person who is the seller. If you 
negotiated a, a, a price for something for delivery three months in the future, and you set a price, and you the seller had to honor that price, you ended up getting it for free. So they were transferring their very real value to you for pennies. And likewise, people who had taken their savings and they had it in banks, by the time they actually got the savings, which could have been hundreds or thousands of marks, it wouldn't have bought you a, a postage stamp. Uh, it's very important to understand that the nature of money is such that it transfers value to and from people. Okay. You do some work, you get paid. You, you create something of value, you get paid. Someone does something for you, you pay them. And money is how you do the transaction. Now let's go back and define what was going on at the time. Uh, do you remember what the word is? What do we call November 11th, 1918? What, what the day the war ended? What is that called? Uh, armistice? I, I don't recall. It is called the Armistice Day. Uh huh. And what is an armistice? Um, I guess you're, I don't know, you're laying down your arms. You're, uh, strange enough, that's exactly what it is. I mean, it's perfect definition. Is it a victory for either side? Uh, the war? Yeah. Uh, it's a victory that we stop fighting. That's a well, victory. Well, strange enough, and that, that's, that's a really good concept there. That's exactly right. But the key is that it's not like World War II, where, where there was unconditional surrender by the Germans and the Japanese. World War I ended with Armistice Day. There was a revolution going on in Germany at the time because of the cost of the war. And literally, the French and British soldiers were starting to revolt because they could see how senseless the war is. And it was an especially senseless war. So, so you had armistice and after armistice day and when both sides pulled back, how did they settle the peace? What was that called? Um, I don't recall, Bob. You'll have to help me out with that one. Okay. It was called the Treaty of Versailles. Oh, of course. Yes. And that, and that required reparations, uh, from the well, losers. It, it, exactly. In, in the year that transpired after Armistice Day and before they signed the Treaty of Versailles, the French and the British, who were in far better shape than the Germans were, uh, mm -hmm. toughened up their stance and they demanded uh, payment for the Germans for, for being involved in the war. And let me give you an idea of why that took place, because it's important to understand in every town and village in France, no matter how small, there is some kind of remembrance statue where they list the names of the people who were killed in World War One, World War II, Algeria, and, and uh, Indochina. Now, the interesting thing is the town that Barbara and I had a little small farm in, there were 106 people from that particular village, 106 young men, including three from one family, who had been killed in the war. So if if in World War One, in one tiny village in France, 106 people were killed, how many do you suppose died in World War Two in the same village? Why well, I don't know. Five. Five. Five? Okay, so what happened, and this was true of the British, it was true of the French, and it was certainly true of the Austrians and the Germans and the Russians. We destroyed an entire generation of young men. So the, the British and the French were pissed, and they were in a position to cram it down the throats of the Germans, and they did. And they demanded payments from the Germans the Germans couldn't possibly make. So 
that's a long explanation of how uh, Germany got into the position of printing money to beat the band. Uh, and printing money is exactly what inflation is. And then uh, Alfred goes into the dangers of that and the ramifications of what it means to your society. Now, by 1922, the farmers in Germany couldn't afford the fuel to take their food to to the major towns, and the people in the towns couldn't afford to buy food because there was so little of it, and because price sometimes changed two or three times in a day. Uh, the, the importance of the book is that it shows how deadly inflation is. And we, we've just kind of accepted inflation as something that's part of nature. And that's absolute rubbish, okay? Inflation is a tax. It's a way of governments paying for things without a direct taxation that people are aware of. And, uh, you know, they want to blame everybody for inflation. It's the oil companies, it's the gas stations, it's Putin. But the fact of the matter is inflation always goes back to the actions of the government. And that was true in, in 1922, and it's true in 2022. Absolutely, Bob. And now I think maybe we should go back to uh, the second letter where we start to talk about you actually addressed uh, credit and the need for credit when you talked about the pig farmer needing rice uh, and why we have to have credit. Obviously, uh, you know, it's but money is actually uh, evolves from production. That's one thing that's totally foreign, a foreign concept to uh, currently to our economists. They, they see anything money just as whatever the government or the Federal Reserve creates. Not So really, money is, and your entitlement to money and your right to your money is based on what you produce. You produce something and someone else agrees to buy it, and you have that contract with them. That is, that is money. Do I have that right? Well, you do, but the key to it is it's not only what, what you produce, it's what you consume. Both actions create credit, and that, that's important, and that's entirely separate from the mechanism of actually balancing the books, okay? And as far as the United States government's concerned, the Treasury just prints money. And and that the one thing that I got out of the book was how dangerous uh, inflation is. Uh, we, we went from, okay, here's what money is supposed to do, and here's why you need to understand it, which, of course, I totally accept. To and here's what happens if you don't understand it, and that's incredibly destructive to the society. Some people end up far better off, and some people end up far worse off, and that's important because there, there's a great video, and I would highly encourage all of your listeners go to Google. And put in a video of monkey envy. And if you go to YouTube at, and watch this video of two monkeys in a cage and one monkey has been fed grapes and the other monkey has been fed uh, cucumber. Yeah. <laughs> and the monkey that's been fed cucumber flat goes off. And what does that have to do with today? Well, uh, the World Economic Forum and the meeting in Davos, 1,500 of the very richest and most powerful and most beautiful people in the world flew their private jets into Davos so they could sit down and have a meeting and talk about how the rest of us should learn to eat insects at the the WHO, not the WHO, uh, the UN literally just came out and said uh, private ownership of vehicles should be outlawed. So you got that situation where you got the ultra elite, the one tenth of one percent, flying around in their private jets, needing lobster and steak, 
And then the 99.9%, which is the rest of us eating bugs. Now, if that isn't a recipe for disaster, I don't know what is. And he talks about it in the books. And and the dichotomy today is probably a hundred times more serious than the dichotomy a uh, hundred years ago. People were rich then, but n- not to the extent of flying all over the world in their private jet all by themselves to tell people they shouldn't own automobiles. Uh, you've got the Netherlands which is telling 30% of their farmers uh, you're producing nitrogen, and nitrogen is a dangerous gas, therefore you're going to have to shut your your farm down. Uh, excuse me, nitrogen is 78% of what we breathe since <laughs> when it's been a greenhouse gas. I mean, that's simply absurd. But uh, when I consider the, the dichotomy between what uh, the ultra elite are doing and the rest of us, what they're saying we should do, uh, there's going to be serious problems as a result. And of course, uh, what did, uh, I'm going to ask another kind of trick question. What was the impact uh, of the inflation of 1921 and 1922? What did it do to the German country? Um, well, it, it, it diluted, um, it, it basically stole from the people that had legitimate claims to money, the people that were producing things, and the government. And so the Germans had to print money to make good on the reparations. So they printed enormous amounts of money, which essentially uh, was like the monkey that you're talking about that were, was given cucumbers. Uh, and, and, of course, the, uh, the value was transferred to France and to the other side, to um, France and England. Uh, so the people started to get hurt very, very badly. The the masses of people started getting hurt very badly in Germany. Okay, but what did it lead to? What 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 transpired as a direct result of the hyperinflation? Well, Hitler and the Nazis. Thank you, thank you. Exactly. That's exactly right. Now, Bob, I I want to just I just want to break in here on on a thought that you've been talking about. Uh, how dangerous it is, money printing, and you talked about the Davos crowd. How did that elite, I can remember the 50s and the 60s when we didn't have so so many super, super rich people. And so I've maintained all along that what we've seen is this inflation, this money printing going on in the United States that has actually resulted in this reallocation of wealth to a very few number of multi-billionaires that are sitting around that flying their private jets to Davos, as you talked about, hasn't, hasn't inflation already set this up? Hasn't the inflation already created this elite group of people that are now ready to make all the rest of us eat insects and, and walk everywhere we go? Actually not. Okay. Uh, the success of Amazon has nothing to do with inflation. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, the key is that because of globalization, which is really uh, computerization, okay, computerization allowed globalization, and globalization allowed somebody like Steve Jobs uh, to take a, a minor uh, computer company and, and build it into the biggest computer company in the world, and Bill Gates to make tens and hundreds of billions of dollars in Tesla. What has happened is globalization has concentrated the wealth in in the hands of a very narrow group of people. Now, if, if your readers and your listeners will go to any history book, history books are filled with stories of the elite and all the stupid things they did that ended up destroying their own societies. And I, I, I would submit that that's exactly what's going to happen with the World Economic Forum. The, the World Economic Forum really uh, it has almost nothing to do with inflation. There's been a, a giant increase in the transfer to the one-tenth of one percent over the last two years. Mm-hmm. It's a stupidity of governments. 
But that wasn't because of inflation. Inflation was a side effect. Inflation didn't cause it. Inflation was a result. But what we've done is we've concentrated the wealth into the hands of a very narrow group of people who are totally unelected, who are looking out for themselves. And, and you know, you use the term already. Hillary Clinton said it, okay, Um we're, we're absolutely meaningless to these people. Yes. And if things like COVID, I mean, frankly, COVID was depopulation. They wanted to get rid of a bunch of us so they can keep the rest of us in slavery. But there has been a deliberate effort on the part of the World Economic Forum and many governments. Uh, Klaus Schwab has introduced 3,800 of its accolades into governments of countries all over the world. And this unelected group of people are destroying the economy. Inflation is just part of it. I mean, certainly in Europe, we have a very bad uh, drought this year, which is caused by nature, okay? But the cost of energy and the cost of fuel is going to go through the roof very shortly. The nuclear power stations in France are having to shut down. Uh, Germany is going to lose the ability of the Rhine River to transport coal and grain literally this week. Okay, so inflation is part of it, but inflation is not all of it. What is important there, and he absolutely talks about it in the book, is the concentration of wealth. Uh, the people who get the benefit of negative things, such as inflation, but the, the concentration of wealth today is probably a hundred or a thousand times greater than it was back then. All right. Well, for sure. And I, I, I think obviously what comes through in the book and an understanding of what money really is, what credit and money really is, is the supply side of the equation. The Keynesians have been all about the demand side, printing money and deficit spending by governments, but clearly... Now, whether it's a natural event, and we're talking about the drought that's keeping the rivers from being able to transport goods, uh, you know, all manner of, of uh, supply issues that have cropped up, some of which have been man-created, such as COVID, created by governments that have restricted the flow of people and so forth. Uh, some of it is nature, but when we have a, when supply is cut off and the monetary system or the same units of currency still exist, then we're going to have inflation, right? Exactly right. And strange enough, I mean, the U.S. just passed an important law. And, and er, everyone kind of misses the most important thing. The amount of money that uh, the government's going to spend is, is relatively minor. It's less than one percent of what the government's going to spend over the next 10 years. But what is important and most people have ignored it's the militarization of the IRS. They're going to oh, yes. double the number of agents. And to be an IRS agent, you're going to have to be qualified with the weapon and be prepared to use it. And, and I, I'm just absolutely staggered at the idea of IRS agents running around armed. They walk into your office and say, okay, they pull their gun out and say, we don't agree with your figures, hand over all your money. Yeah. That happened in Roman times where, where the Roman government actually allowed people to become private citizens, private companies, to, to become tax collectors, and they got to keep a portion of what they collected. And I'll just flat tell you, that's exactly what's going to happen now. And I don't believe that existed uh, during the German hyperinflation. I'm certainly not aware of it. Yeah. You know, we're just going to have to leave it go at that, Bob. We're out of time already. It's incredible. We barely scratched the surface, and I hope that we can come back and talk some more about this book, the contents of this book, what we've talked more about today as the you know the the application of the concepts some of the early concepts introduced in this book but the book goes on further letter 5 for example talks about the migration of money the immortality of money uh we get into interest rates and and the importance of interest and uh where gold fits into the monetary system and and why uh why why it's a good thing to have 
uh, but not necessary, not not absolutely necessary. There's just a whole lot of topics that are so relevant to what's going on today, Bob. That I hope that we can come back and pick this up sometime very in the very near future, uh, before it's too late for people to contemplate. Because I think we're on a slippery slope right now towards something that we don't even most people can't even begin to to recognize and fathom. Uh, I, any any last thoughts before we yeah, I, conclude? I, I totally agree with what you just said, and, and let me say, and of course I, I'm talking my own book in a way, uh, I participated in making this book happen. I don't get any of the revenue from the book, and I don't want any revenue of the book, but uh, for 25 bucks, it will give you a far better understanding of money uh, than you've ever had before. And there are some really valuable, valuable lessons in there, given the the crisis that we're facing today uh, because of the destruction of the economy of COVID uh, and this incredible concentration of power and money in the hands of very few people who, frankly, want to turn the rest of us into slaves. I, I'm not particularly interested in being a slave no, no, nor uh, should anybody in their right mind, uh, Bob. I want to thank you so much for spending the time with us today to help us start to understand. And, and I would agree totally that money revelation is so important. There's so much there's so much there that when I started preparing for our discussion today, I said, oh, my goodness, I have not spent the time I need to. I've, I've got through the first um, the first the first uh, volume. Uh, and the other two, value and money emergency. Maybe very quickly, what does the value section have to do with? I mean, just give us a quick overview of that discussion of value. Uh, and I couldn't do a quick overview. We'll okay. have to, to okay. do that for another time. Oh, okay. And you did you did mention the monetary emergency, which is the third volume, and you think we're fast approaching that right now in the United States. I, I would say that one. If you ever look at a, uh, a chart of hyperinflation in Germany, you'll see a long sort of flat line, and then all of a sudden it's a hockey stick. All of a sudden it just takes off like a bat out of that hot place, and it is, it is not a good thing. And, and so people need to be on their toes because this thing, I think, could spring up almost in any moment. So, um, let thank- me, let, yeah, Give me one more minute because okay, go- it's very yeah. important. You just raised an important issue. Hyperinflation is not a lot of inflation. Hyperinflation is when people lose belief in the currency. And when they lose belief in the currency, they run out, spend everything they can as fast as they can. And I think we're very near that situation. When you look at the increase in credit card debt, and the increase in the number of people applying for credit cards, we we are at the right at the stage where people are about to give up on the value of the dollar, and that's going to cause problem. Well, I'm afraid I'm afraid you're right. Uh, I hope and pray you're not, but it looks that way to me as well. Thank you so much, Bob, for being with us, and we'll look to pick this up sometime in the near future once again. All right, folks. Well, that is it. That is it for this week. Uh, next week, John Rubino, uh, Michael Oliver, and Patrick Highsmith of Timberline Resources will be with me. Until then, goodbye and God's blessings to you. Thank you again for listening to Turning Hard Times into Good Times with Jay Taylor. 